Hi, Jonah. Hey, Bob. How are you? I'm okay. How are you doing? I'm good. It's been a long time since I was on Blogging Heads. It has been. Well, you know, we have pretty high standards, and it's been a while since you've written a book. And in between books, to be honest, Jonah, you're not worthy of us. But now you have a book out. I appreciate that. I appreciate your honesty, Bob. That's well, the only thing know, I can always count on you. I feel we owe that to you, after all. <laughs> because you have, you have been on Blogging Heads a number of times. So, <laughs> it's called Excuse Suicide me. of the West. Yeah. Your brand new book is today Pub Date. Are we honored with a Pub Date appearance? This is actually a day before pub date. Oh, so we so. will post this on pub date. That'd be great. That'd yeah. be, that will make the difference, I think. It will. I think that'll so. Be the, that'll be the snowflake that causes the avalanche. Suicide of the West, kind of a downer, but yeah. uh, let's, see if the, let's see if the subtitle can pick us up. <laughs> <laughs> How the rebirth of tribalism, populism, nationalism, and identity politics is destroying American democracy. Well, apparently not. Well, uh, the last so, chapter's more upbeat, but anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I'm sure you'll, you'll, you'll uh, have us in a better mood by the end. Uh, ambitious uh, title, ambitious book. You know, I should say it's not quite as intimidating as it may look to some people because the final 100 pages is appendix notes, bibliography, and index. That's right. You take that away, you got a pretty svelte volume there, Jonah. Well, you know, it's still 300 something pages. That's okay. Yeah, no, it's serious. It's a serious, it's a large scale argument. <laughs> you, you step back and survey the entire sweep of human history virtually. Yeah, well, you know, you, you've been known to do something similar in a couple books. Uh, yeah, but I got over it. Of course, when <laughs> I was your age, I did do impetuous things. It's true. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, where to begin? Let's start with the more contemporary part and eventually step back and take in the full sweep of your. Uh, kind of historically based argument. Sure. The rebirth of tribalism, populism, nationalism, and identity politics. Now, tribalism has become a big word. It has. Like, only over the last year or two. Now, uh, I mean, in particular, over the last year or two. Was this in your head when you like did your book proposal and started the book? Was the word itself in your head? It was. The working title of the book was originally The Tribe of Liberty. Mm. And, um, you know, part of my inspiration from it comes from a a passage from Friedrich Hayek in the, uh, uh, in the Fatal Conceit, where he talks about how we are all evolved from living in, as you know this stuff better than I do, everyone who hasn't read Moral Animal should go out and buy it today. Um, <laughs> um, uh, we were involved in little troops or bands, and that um, Hayek calls that the microcosm. We still have that wiring. Um, and the trick is, is that the logic of the microcosm cannot be applied to the macrocosm, which is the extended order contractual society, sort of the difference between what the Germans would call Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft and all that stuff. And so anyway, the argument I, I originally set out to make was that, and I think is in this book, is that reason alone isn't up to it. You actually need to inculcate a kind of tribal passion about liberal democratic capitalism, about democracy, um, sort of the difference between patriotism and nationalism. If you don't, if you don't teach that on an emotional, visceral level to people, they won't cling to it. And I, I think, so that idea was in my head. turns out that there were a lot of people writing books, planning on writing books in around 2015 on tribalism. Uh, I've been reading Amy Chua's book, actually I've been listening to Amy Chua's book on political tribes, and there's a lot of overlap there. Um, uh, every day I see another book coming out about that has the word tribe in it or the idea of tribalism one way or the other. And, mm -hmm. and, um, and I think some of that is downstream of the stuff that people like Paul Bloom and others were working on for a while. Um, because that's, that is, as you know, John Tooby talked about the coalition instinct and how we've come, we sort of come equipped with this, you know, uh, uh, preloaded us versus them, them thinking. Right? That, or that can be activated. Yes. Under, under a variety of circumstances. So I gather the idea is that the reason you need a tribal devotion to ideals like democracy or rule of law, or whatever, is because in your view, otherwise, what, what you're up against is the more old fashioned kind of tribalism, right. which is ethnically based, religiously based, nationally ba ma based, maybe uh, you would also consider a potential peril. But so it's either, it's either those kinds of uh, tribalisms prevail or we have a kind of equally passionate attachment to ideals that transcend them or, or combat them. Right. I mean, I would argue that um, 
you know, as Will Herbert would put it, you know, we're homo religio, um, or we have a hardwired innate desire to find meaning and a sense of belonging in the world. And if you take out, you can't, you know, as the Greek philosopher or Roman philosopher Horace put it, um, you can chase nature out with a pitchfork, but it'll always come rushing back in. It, people need a sense of understanding of their place in the universe. Mm -hmm. And if we don't give them the right one uh, in a, in a strictly Chestertonian sense, they'll look for the wrong ones. And there are plenty of wrong ones on the shelf for them to grab on the left and the right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just realized I should pause and introduce this, by the way, I'm Robert Wright. This is the right show available on both, on both streaming video and audio podcasts. You are Jonah Goldberg. I guess I was assuming you need no introduction because you are, you are so, you are, you are uh, so hailed on the right. And uh, so in some, not so much these days, but anyway, last, well, we can talk about that, but certainly notorious in parts of the left in part uh, because of the title of a, of a book of yours, a super best selling book called liberal fascism. Mm -hmm. um, we can talk about uh, all this, but, um, but I want to, on this religious thing, I was a little surprised that you start the book by noting that it is not the book is not going to it's not going to be about god or, or even assume the existence of god i'm i'm curious i was a little surprised why did you feel it necessary to make that clear well i'd say yeah the first sentence of the book is there is no god in this book right um one of the things that i find so frustrating on the right these days and and our politics in general but you know uh the right is where you know I have to keep my own house in order first and and call out my own team um the right is losing any interest in making arguments and persuading people and you know I sort of go back to Aristotle on this the politics has to be about persuasion about explaining to people why their interests are better represented in my coalition than in their coalition right and if and the enlightenment whichever version of the Enlightenment, well, the, the version of the Enlightenment that you like, that I like, um, is based upon the idea that ideas matter, that people can be persuaded, that that arguments and evidence and facts and logic can bring people along, right? And if you don't believe that, then why have a deliberative democracy at all? Because deliberation assumes that people can change their mind and that they can be their minds can be changed with a rational appeal either to their conscience or to their intellect. And instead, what we have in our politics a lot these days is simply um, a sort of tendency to just sort of whoever shouts the loudest. Um, it's an emphasis of purity over persuasion. And so one of the things that I wanted to do was simply say, hey, look, you know, you know, if you're, if you're a conservative and you're like liberal democratic capitalism, that's great. Here's, here's some arguments to reassure you. Here are some arguments to warn you off a path that I think you're on, even a suicidal path. And, um, but I want to work, you know, because when I first started on this book, I had no idea, and no did anybody else, that Donald Trump was going to be president. That's not, I was, I had problems with what was going on on the right. When did you start writing it? Like, first started putting words to paper, probably, like, for the proposal, 2014, okay. you know, and then, and, and, and more in earnest in 2015. Okay. Um, and so I wanted to sort of, first of all, arguments based upon God are the ultimate appeal to authority, right? Mm -hmm. That's a logical fallacy that only ever works when everyone pre-commits to that authority, right? You know, kids can say because mom says so or because dad says so, but that's only because it's dad. If you're not one of dad's kids, appealing to your dad has no authority. Same thing with appeals to God. So instead, I want to work on the, the, the values and terms and metrics or whatever you want to call it that people like you care about, right? You know, sort of uh, economic well-being, you know, health, uh, liberty, uh, tolerance, all of these sorts of things, right? And the sort of the full suite of things that Pinker talks about at book length. In, and, in Enlightenment now, you mean, or in, yeah, in no, Better in, Angels? In both, really, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so on those terms alone, you know, Deirdre McCloskey is a big influence on me and all this. On those terms alone, virtually any metric that you can come up with that are supposedly at the center of this sort of secular morality of, of normal progressives things have been getting much 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 better since 1700 right and for the first time in human history the average human being is not poor 
starting in 1700. And right now we're living in the greatest moment of uh, poverty alleviation in all of human history because of this unfolding miracle. And the other reason why I call it the miracle is um, not because I think it's divine, but because I think it's inexplicable. It is, you know, there's a mystery to a miracle. And while there are lots of people who have theories, some theories have a lot of explanatory power and I don't dismiss them wholly. Um, but there's no consensus on where this explosion, what Deirdre McCloskey calls the great fact, right? This huge upturn in prosperity that starts basically in England and in Holland 300 years ago. And so I wanted to argue on the less terms for my conclusions about why we should be grateful for the miracle, why we should be grateful for what happened. You can still talk about the problems that our society has, but this idea that I think Schumpeter predicted in the 1940s of we've basically turned antagonism towards our own civilization into an industry um, hmm. is deeply unhelpful. And that's interesting. Boy, there's a lot of places I could go. Uh, I mean, one, one, I guess, is, I mean, first I note that, you, you know, not all conservatives view this capitalism as unnatural, <laughs> right? I mean, there is the argument that it's a pretty straightforward extension of human nature, but that, that's, I, I think we should leave that as kind of a footnote, unless you want to, unless you want to. Yeah, no, look, I, I, as I say in the book, capitalism is on that and it's it's more it's it's more of an argument that i'm trying to make about how people should look at these issues mm -hmm. then you know my some of my colleagues don't like this idea that rights are unnatural my only argument is is that for all intents and purposes if it was natural for human beings to set up societies that were rights-based that were democratic that respected the sovereignty of the individual and respected you know the autonomy of individuals and property rights and free speech and all these things, they would have showed up a little earlier in the evolutionary record, right? I mean, depending on how you do the math, 250, 300,000 years is a long time to wait for something to be to emerge that is natural. Well, yeah, but of course, you could only assume a modern form, uh, given certain technological uh, tools, I, I would say. But, but, um, okay. but in any event... Um, the the uh, so this this thing you said about Schumpeter having predicted or or at least warned about the possibility of turning our passions or, or our antagonisms like kind of toward the system itself. Mm -hmm. I mean that, that seems to me an interesting way to describe it because I think the conventional diagnosis of America today, at least, is the antagonisms. There are two tribes, uh, broadly speaking. You can subdivide them. But, uh, and, and they're turning their antagonisms on one another. It's just old fashioned sure. tribal conflict and, and it's not nearly as uh, like uh, philosophically sophisticated as, you know, antagonism toward the, the larger. Uh, well, I, I mean, that's I, an interesting question. I guess they, they both have their complaints about the system, mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, and that's an interesting way to look at it. But you take my, my point? Yeah, no, I do. And, and, and look, I mean, we can have, um, you know, when, you know, when things are going badly, lots of, there can be lots of sub things going badly as well. So I agree, look, populism is tribal. Populism is a form of identity politics. We're in a populist moment on the left and the right. There are all sorts of problems with that. But, you know, so just so the viewers of this August program understand where I'm coming from. So Schumpeter, in the words of his biographer, turns, um, Marx on his head. Uh, under under Marx, you have this view that the, the essentially it's it's the Christian view that that the meek will inherit the earth, right? The proletariat will get class consciousness. It'll seize the means of production, and pretty soon we're in this essentially romantic Shangri-La at the end of history, right? Schumpeter says, no, 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 that's wrong. Schumpeter says that the people who are going to kill capitalism are the children of the capitalists themselves, and. Uh, heavily influenced by Nietzsche and genealogy of morals, um, Schumpeter makes this sort of argument that, you know, borrowing from Nietzsche, Nietzsche argued that you had, it, historically you had the priestly caste or class and you have the, um, the knightly class. The knightly class were the men of action, right? The nobles, the guys with swords and, and, and men of power, and they made their own morality. The priestly class, because they didn't have troops and they weren't people of power, they used the only weapon that they had, which were words. And they used words to basically, again, this is Nietzsche's telling, right, um, to invert p 
people's understandings of their own civilization. So whereas power and might used to be signs of honor and strength and courage and virtue, the Christian priests in Nietzsche's Talon turn those things into vices. So suddenly strength is worse and weakness is better. Meekness is better than, than power. Um, uh, self-denial is better than self-assertion. And, uh, and that's, this is sort of where you get the idea of the rise of the slave morality of Christianity. I'm not saying I agree with all of this, right? But, but Schumpeter takes a very similar, he takes this sort of structure of that argument and he applies it to capitalism. And he says, you know, what happens is, you know, first of all, capitalism depends on values that it didn't create and cannot restore once lost. And that the, the captains of industry, the entrepreneurs, the innovators, um, they have children who don't want to be innovators, right? And it's sort of, it's sort of like the – Nassim Taleb gets at this a lot in one of his books. You know, um, people think there's – there's this cliche out there that education makes countries richer, and I understand the argument. But the reason why individual parents have their kids educated is not to make them richer for the most part, unless they come from a pretty poor background – the reason why rich people overeducate their kids is a hedge against poverty. And um, so what happens is, you know, you get the, the, the industrial ruling classes, their kids become lawyers. And then after a couple generations, they become communications majors and poets. I mean, just look at you know, Warren Buffett's kids. And, um, and these kids grow up as a class with this priestly mindset of resentment against the system that exists and they become an adversary culture. And so much of, you know, a lot of that mid 20th century neoconish, but also, you know, not quite neoconish stuff from, from, from Daniel Bell and, and Nat Glazer and those guys um, and Irving Crystal was part of this argument about the adversary culture that was breeding values and teaching values that were antithetical to the values that sustain capitalism in the first place. This is the cultural co contradiction of capitalism. I think there's a lot of explanatory value in that. If you look at the people who have the commanding heights of the culture, they are deeply disdainful or skeptical about the, about the, the morality of capitalism, the morality of the, of the, of the liberal democratic project. Um, you listen to any Oscars show, award ceremony, they pee from a great height on all bourgeois values. Now the even promulgating bourgeois values is a huge problem. You look at the kids who joined SDS. You look at the kids who tore up the paving stones in 68 in Paris. Um, these were the affluent. They weren't the working class. They spoke, they claimed to speak for the working class, but so much of the sort of woke social justice warrior stuff is a kind of play acting for economic elites who are bred as part of this mass class that is antagonistic towards liberal democratic capitalism. And I think you now have a big chunk of that rising up on the right as well. You know, Steve Bannon, you know, he's a millionaire from Seinfeld money, and all he wants to do is tear the entire power structure down um, out of this sort of Nietzschean resentment of everything. And he at least admits it. I mean, he says he's a Leninist, you know, and the only way I think he is a Leninist is he does believe in the worse the better. Yeah, although they would, uh, he has a different uh, stated target than people on the left. I mean, I mean, Ban Bannon, uh, and, and I guess, and he thinks he's representing the masses when he says this, and I guess you could say the same thing about the people you identify as being on the left. Maybe they, yeah. all, they all believe they represent the masses, uh, but, and to some extent, maybe their critiques actually converge when you think about it. They both have issues with the effects of global capitalism mm -hmm. um the uh and and of course there is the convergence on the subject of trade in particular when it when it assumes kind of a po form of a policy critique if you go back and you look at some of the things pat buchanan started writing starting in the early 1970s yeah and you, and you put your hand over the top over who wrote it 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 could come from a lot of bernie types you know sure. the guys at the at the yacht basin trying to take over our country and the the, and 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 uh, absolutely, I mean, populism there, does that. There's o there's overlap of of, of left and right uh, populism. Um, the uh, you know, of course, the the uh, but it's it's on the right that the enemy is uh, identified as as just kind of centrally identified with. 
globalization in the sense that, I, I mean, you know, the, the enemy is thought of as, among others, there's a variety of enemies and there's... No shortage know, of enemies, yeah. A lot of enemies <laughs> are, are perceived on the right. But when you look at the elite enemies, the, the upper class enemies, they are cosmopolitan, right? They are, they are, part of the critique is they identify as closely with their peers in Europe as they do, more closely with their peers in Europe than they do with fellow Americans in the heartland, right? So That's right, that's right. And, 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 that's, and, and that's a difference. I mean, because the, the elites you're talking about, uh, the, uh, the Hollywood elites and so on, they are cosmopolitans. They, by and large, champion cosmopolitan values. Right. And so their critique of the larger kind of machine is, uh, is a little different. And it's, of course, on behalf of different people. It's much more likely to be on behalf of people of color, obviously. Um, yeah, but you go back and you look at, like, Bernie Sanders before he gave in to the logic of running for president in the Democratic Party. You know, he would, he would rail against, uh, I think it was in an Ezra Klein interview, rail against the Koch brothers for being for open borders, because that's a right, as he put it, a right wing right. Koch brothers thing, right? Right, right. And um, uh, where, and if you go back and you look at starting with the anti globalization riots in the late 1990s, you know, there's a lot of overlap between the sort of Naderite anti globalism stuff mm -hmm. and some some of the stuff on the right, and um, that convergence, I think. You're right. There are different flavors of it. I mean, this is one of these points that I, I have in arguments with my friends on the right where they say, well, look, you know, what's so bad about Donald Trump using populism? Every Republican president has used populism. And that's true. Every Democratic president has used populism some part, to some extent as part of their coalition. But not all populisms are the same. And, you know, uh, and there are flavors of populism. They get more toxic the more intense they get. And one of them is this idea that my supporters are the real people. They represent the real spirit or Volksgemeinschaft or whatever it is, the authentic people. And the other people aren't, don't matter and aren't real. And you get versions of that from Trump. You get versions of that on the right. You get some versions of that on the left, but far less, which I think is one of the redeeming things about left-wing populism in America, at least right you now. You mean on the left they don't say these are the real Americans? Um, because as they certainly say that on the right. This is the real American. Yeah, I think they say American. it less on the left. I mean, yeah, and when they yeah. do say, when they, they, when they talk about the real people, it is still more class-based than it is ethnic-based or, 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 you know, uh, creedal-based. It's, it's sort of, it's, it's, a, it's an older form of sort of Huey Long populism than a kind of, um, mm -hmm. I don't, I, I'm trying to think, then a George Wallace populism. Right. right. Yeah. Now, so this kind of leads to the question of how you relatively apportion blame. Now, on the one uh -huh. hand, you, 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 you spend a certain amount of time in the book uh, critiquing identity politics. Yep. Um, I think you, you, at the same time, acknowledge that uh, Trump's base is in some ways its own form of identity politics, yep. a kind of a Absolutely. white identity politics. And different people disagree kind of over who started it in a certain sense. I mean, I think there's no, there's no doubt that you can, if you listen to what Trump supporters say, they do seem to be to some extent reacting against identity politics and some of the themes you, you hear, whether it's, it's uh, you know, Black Lives Matter, Latino stuff, transgender, they're reacting against all of that. Uh, they're reacting against the speech codes that mm -hmm. they associate with those people, with the, the privileges they see those people as demanding. There is all that. On the other hand, uh, people on the left would say, well, the, the reason identity, what you call identity politics is strong is partly because the, they, these people have their own sense of adversity. Certainly, uh, Latinos more than ever are, are energized by what they're hearing from sure. Trump land. With African Americans, it's, a, it's an older uh, grievance and an older reality of, uh, sure. of persecution and so on. And, and, and so, you know, you can look at it in these different ways. I'm curious, do you view yourself as apportioning blame equally? I would say your, your critique of identity politics probably consumes more space in a sense than, you, than a, any critique of white identity politics, but maybe you maybe disagree. How, how do you view, like, I mean, who started this is obviously kind of simplistic way to look at it, but <laughs> 
how do you think of like if, if you you know how much time if you, if you had an hour and you could you were going to spend it grabbing various people by the collar and saying you got to straighten up how would the hour be apportioned among the different people yeah no look i mean look it's tough and it's funny you know i, I get why a lot of people want me to get into this blame thing and i and i think and i get i get into some of the blame without stuff to be sure um but I, I think it's worth. The identity politics is in your subtitle. Is yeah, one yeah, yeah. That. That, that's right. Um, yeah. So part of the problem is, is that I think the retreat to identity politics, though, happens upstream of the kind of politics that we're talking about here for a second, right? Um, I think that a lot of the problems that we have, everyone wants to look at Washington, and I think in some ways it's looking at the wrong end of the sewage pipe, you know, because I think a lot of the problems we have have to do that are, are, are much more structural and long current long term i think donald trump is making a lot of things worse but he's also more of a symptom than a cause of our problems and so look i mean if i if 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 i had to sort of pick a villain in all of this which i don't want to do i but i would say that you know the sort of howard zinn version of america you know howard zinn's people's history of america is still the number one i believe the number one history text in in america in high school and colleges and he's very explicit about this. I mean, you give him points for honesty, he basically says he only cares about history from the perspective of the victims, whether it's this Indian tribe or the Irish in this coal mine, coal, coal, you know, coal industry era, or whether it's African Americans or it's, it's Latinos. He just, his is a social history of the victims. And I have zero problem telling that part of the story. And that, in fact, I want that, those stories to be told. Mm -hmm. What I have a problem with is this idea that those are the only legitimate stories to tell, right? Um, the analogy I keep coming back to is, remember the movie Go Goldfinger, the James Bond movie, right? Yeah. Okay, so in Goldfinger, Goldfinger doesn't actually try to rob Fort Knox. What he tries to do is irradiate all of the gold in Fort Knox so that it can't be used for like 10,000 years, taking it off the market, making his second largest stockpile, infinitely more valuable. What I take objection to is, forget it, any politics for a second. I have not yet guessed the other half of this analogy, so, so, so do go ahead. <laughs> sure, is that so much of the sort of, these, these, the, the, the sort of new class intellectuals, the sort of the priestly class, as Schumpeter would put it, um, uh, they only care about irradiating, they want to irradiate all the usable gold from our history and say it is invalid and unusable okay. in our political discourse, right? And so the, going back to Charles Beard, the founding can only be understood as rich white men trying to protect their property rights, right? Um, all these notions about, you find all, the, you know, all of these idiot controversies you find on, and hyped on college campuses, which I'm, I'm sure I'm at least at, that you're at least a little weary of hearing about as well, it's always this stuff about how even the concept of free speech um, is uh, about entrenched white power and white privilege and all these kinds of things. Our notions of liberal democratic capitalism are, are, are enmeshed in white supremacy and cannot be you know, separated from it. That the history of America is simply a history of genocide, oppression, bigotry, and woe. And that is nonsense, first of all. Um, you know, is it, are, are there those stories in our history? Absolutely. Should we teach those things? Absolutely. Shouldn't we also teach that, you know, this country s spilt an enormous amount of blood and treasure getting rid of slavery, getting rid of inherited titles of nobility, getting, you know, uh, you know, there's a good story to tell in the American story. And that's all civilizations ultimately are, the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. And the story that the only a legitimate story you're allowed to tell right now is this really nasty story about America. And I think that that is the suicidal path. And so identity politics fits into that mm -hmm. because to the extent that identity politics means something in this context, it means that I can, I can sort of summarize a whole a person's entire being simply by some, by his relationship to some grievance that occurred before he was born for the most part. And that to me is is much more similar to the what humanity believed in before the rise of the Enlightenment, right? 
aristocracy, aristocracy has existed in every single society that has ever existed mm -hmm. in one form or another. It, at its core, it is the belief that certain people are better or more deserving than other people simply by virtue of an accident of birth. That's what identity politics says. I think the best version of America is the version of America that says you're supposed to take people as you find them. Okay. Right? This narrative that starts with the, the Declaration gets improved and built upon and made central by Abraham Lincoln at Gettysburg and reaches something like its apotheosis with Martin Luther King saying that this country signed a promissory note when it, when it issued the Declaration of Independence that we owe it all to all people, including black people, to judge them by the contents of their character. That is the good American story. And these days, to say that, that we should judge people by the contents of the character rather than the color of their skin elicits riots of rage in certain quarters of the left, and increasingly now, certain quarters of the right. And I think that's, that's sad and dangerous. Okay, let me say a couple things. First, a little footnote for uh, aficionados of The Right Show. Uh, as it happens, the previous guest uh, on, uh, on uh, Friday, it posted Friday, uh, John Cabot zinn the uh, creator of mindfulness-based stress reduction and a kind of a mindfulness beginning. On. The reason his name is Cabot zinn is because he's actually the son-in-law of Howard Zinn, the, the, the historian you note. So that's a little mm -hmm. piece of trivia. Um, the, uh, and then a couple of things about what you just said. One is there's a, there's a little bit of an irony. I mean, in a certain sense, I would think you'd want to emphasize the horrors of America's past and the horrors of the West past, because then you can argue that things are getting, have gotten a lot better, which is an argument you make. It's kind of like the Steve Pinker argument. I mean, his, his kind of, it's funny, his, his upbeat argument, which is sometimes criticized as kind of uh, uh, apologetics for capitalism or for imperialism, is in fact dependent on his acknowledging and even emphasizing a lot of the darkness in the in the American story and in the Western story. There's sure. that. So you that's kind of a dual use fact about our history. As I said, uh, I mean, all you have to teach the bad stuff. Right, too. right. Thing that it can't is, is the only thing that we need to know about about Christopher Columbus right. that he was a right. genocidal murderer. Is but, it? But 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 the the and the other thing I'd say is so so your book it spends a certain amount of time on what you both you call the Western uh, miracle as associated mm -hmm. in particular with the advent of you know the Enlightenment the advent of kind of modern more or less capitalism and so on, and then sometimes you talk about the American miracle. Right. Um, it it is true that the 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 the, the part the essence of a, of the miracle that you want to extol. The, the, in a sense, transcendence of tribalism has been very late to actually arrive, right? I mean, initially only property, white, prop, white male property holders could vote, and then that loosened up, then finally women, blacks, and so on. Right. But it's been actually, the miracle didn't arrive full blown until like, you know, in my lifetime, I think blacks have been lynched in the South. So uh, you take that point too, right? It's it, it, sure. it in a certain sense is not a very long lived miracle at this point. Well, no, no, I think that's unfair. I think that the problem is is that you're 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 talking about the miracle as an I, ideal to move towards to, right? And I, I and I I consider it that to be sure, right? Um, I look at it. As you know, it's like Seymour Martin Lipset used to say, if you don't, if you only know one country, you don't know any country, right? Mm -hmm. And um, you need to have some comparative baseline to understand what's going on. And so the remarkable thing about the miracle is this change in consciousness, this change in rhetoric, this change in the way that we view ourselves. And of course, it takes time to unfold. So, in one sense, absolutely. It is better now for more people in 2018 than it was in 1918 or even 1958. I think that's indisputable, right? Mm -hmm. It's like there are a lot of conservatives and libertarians who say this isn't a free country anymore. And I've been having this argument with them for 15, 20 years. And I say, well, you know, except for the women and the blacks, you know, right? I mean, because this idea that it, you know, like G. Gordon Liddy used to say, this used to be a free country. Well, for who? I think that is a perfectly legitimate point that the left brings up all the time and the right does not spend enough time on. That said, the, the standard by which to judge historical moments 
isn't against the abstract perfection of the, of the realized ideal. It is in relation to what came before it. Mm -hmm. And um, by, you know, the slavery part, which is a huge part, notwithstanding the idea that emerges out of the glorious revolution, which was of course imperfect, right? I mean, you have John Locke writing in his notes on toleration that we need to have religious tolerance. It's vital to have religious tolerance, but of course, not for Catholics. Right. You know? <laughs> and what happens is that idea comes over as a cultural norm. And then Jefferson basically puts it in the centrifuge and it says, not only should Catholics have freedom, but atheists and Hindus and, and, and pagans and whatever, everybody should have it. You know, Barack Obama used to make this all a point all the time. He used to steal a page from Rawls and say, um, if you could be born in any moment, in any place in the world, you didn't know if you're going to be black or white or gay or straight or whatever, you probably pick about now in the United States of America. And uh, I think that's, that's right. So you're right to say that, that the miracle is still unfolding and getting better for people who have, who have been too slow to help. But the flip side of that is, where is, where is the celebration of that fact? Where is the gratitude for the fact? Instead, it is, this is proof that capitalism is evil. This is proof that Western style, you know, Western style you know, culture is evil and racist. And I go back to the Lipset point, compared to who? China basically has Jim Crow today in terms of non-ethnic Han. And yet you still have people like Tom Friedman talking about the, the extolling the Chinese model as superior. Um, point to a country that is that is that is that you want to emulate that is less racist than the United States of America that does less well by people I'm sure you can point to Holland or this or that but as a general proposition this miracle is a great and glorious thing particularly for the people who as a you know as representatives of a certain type in the new class are the most likely to denounce it these days yeah um so I want to like kind of in your defense emphasize that you, your book uh, is not a relentless and endless dwelling on the problems on the left. Uh, no, not at all. You're, you're unhappy with what's going on in the right. And let me also, just to make sure people understand the, 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 the scope of your argument, there's a, there's a paragraph in the middle of your book that kind of gets to this point. It's about three or four sentences long. You just summarize the argument. First, the rust of human nature is eating away at the miracle of Western civilization and the American experiment, meaning among other things that tribalism is is uh, reasserting itself second this corruption is nothing new nature is always trying to reclaim what is hers but this corruption expresses itself in new ways in different times as the romantic spirit takes whatever form it must to creep back in uh romanticism i guess being associated with certain kinds of tribalism ethno-nationalism having its kind of its you know kind of soil and blood kind of romanticism um Third, the corruption can only succeed when we willfully and ungratefully turn our backs on the principles that brought us out of the muck of human history in the first place. That's what we've just been talking about. But then you right. say, the last point is that the corruption has now spread disastrously to the right, not just in America, but throughout the West. So this, is, uh, this must hurt you particularly since you are on the right. Um, you want to talk a little more about that? Um, sure. Uh, I, it, 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 yeah. So, um, I mean, I understand why the the identity politics looms so large in a lot of people's lives because that's the that's one of the points of controversy for the book, right? And but uh, for me, you know, um, what you know, my view on nationalism has always been that um, uh, a little is healthy. And a lot is toxic, right? It's like a pinch of salt helps bring out the flavor, right? It helps get people to buy, make binding attachments to um, institutions and ways of life and values and commitments that are important. Too much, and you spoil it, really too much, and it becomes poisonous, right? All poisons are determined by the dose. And there is a push on the right more and more towards this very ill-defined concept of nationalism. Um, and there are people who are responsible about it. You know, my colleagues, some of my colleagues at National Review, you know, reject ethno-nationalism, but they're very big into this civil nationalism or civic nationalism. Hmm. And I'm still sort of nostalgic for the distinction between patriotism and nationalism, which I thought was sort of at the heart of the American tradition. 
And I think that one of the things that is, you know, happening on the right is, uh, and this gets to your blame question, though I don't want to dwell on the blame part, is there is this sense that um, playing by the rules doesn't work anymore and that we should give up on the rules. You know, I got back before we deleted all of it, um, I had an exchange with Michael Anton, the famous author of the Flight 93 election, where I was talking about how, you know, one of the found, one of the central creeds of this country is this idea that you should take people as you find them and that, that, um, that people shouldn't be, you know, divvied up into these abstractions, that they should be able to pursue happiness as they see fit and that merit matters and all these sorts of typical sort of uh, traditional conservative arguments. And, um, and also, to a certain extent, traditional liberal arguments, right, depending on where you want to, what, what strains you want to go through. And his response was, the notion of a colorblind society is dead. We lost that fight. The left won that fight. So now we need a conservative, we need an identity, identity politics of our own. We need to fight fire with fire. And so one of the things I will take blame on, you know, I, there's a reason why the word liberal and progressive aren't in the title of this book. I told my publisher, I paid my dues. I don't want to write any more books with the word liberal in them. And, um, uh, but one of the things I'm responsible, not responsible for, but I contributed to was the right's obsession with Saul Alinsky. You know, he's a, he's a figure who shows up in my first book, shows up in my first book as a villain. You know, I don't like him, right? You know, I mean, the guy dedicated... No, wait, this is in liberal fascism? Yeah, he's in there. Um, um, you know, it rules for radicals as, is dedicated to Lucifer. I think that's a bad thing, right? <laughs> and the, Presumably, there was some irony intended on his part. Yeah, you have to look for it pretty hard, though. And, <laughs> um, uh, and my point is, is that so many people on the right, including, I think, Dinesh is a pristine example of this, became obsessed with this belief, this bedrock belief that since the left was Alinskyite and would do everything and anything it could to achieve power, that we have to do the same thing. And um, so, so much of the support for Don Donald Trump comes into this seething, bubbling intellectual, intellectual argument on the right about, you know, uh, no more Mr. Nice Guy kind of stuff. We have to go for the jugular. You know, we have to do whatever it takes. And then Trump comes in and he does all of this sort of counter puncher, norm breaking stuff. And he was received as sort of, you know, I mean, people call him Cheeto Jesus, but he was received as a sort of messianic figure because he represented this turn away from intellectualism, turn away from argument, right? Even passionate argument. It was all about strength and winning which are at minimum amoral terms. And evangelicals went big for him on this transactional bullshit. And, um, and that turn, you know, which I think with some, some good reason, a lot of conservatives, a lot of normal American sort of rank and file conservatives did as a backlash against the perception of their perceptions of things going on with the mainstream culture that were pushed by the left. Regardless, it doesn't make it right. And I would have arguments with people where they would say, well, you don't understand how angry people are. And I would say, well, let's say for the sake of argument that I don't understand it, even though if, if you know, my Twitter feed, my email box is like opening the Ark of the Covenant and, and you know, Indiana Jones, I mean, just face melting every morning. But let's just say I don't understand how angry people are. When was the last time you made a really important, good, reasonable decision based on blinding rage? Right, but that is the ethos that defi defines so much of 2016, and people went all in for Trump precisely because he was anti-intellectual, precisely because he was passion-driven, not reason-driven. And um, I think intellectual conservatives deserve some of the blame for this because of the way they wanted to conduct the debate for so long that frustrated so many people. But at the end of the day, um, you know, it's funny. I've been writing against populism for 20 years. And it's like nobody noticed until I started writing against populism in the era of Trump. And they're like, oh, you just, you're writing about populism because you don't like Trump. And I was like, well, no. Was your, was your target Buchanan at the beginning or what? You, was it right-wing populism you were? Both. Yeah, both. both. I mean, I, I've, been, I, I've been, you know, the only populist movement I ever supported in any way was the, were the Tea Parties because I thought this was the one populist movement that actually was doing it the right way. It was like Federalist Papers, Road to Serfdom, Live Within Our Means, Cut Taxes, federalism, all kinds of, were there crackpots who were attracted to it? Sure. 
but for the most part, it seemed to me like the ancient libertarian prophecy of libertarians taking over the government and leaving people alone might finally be here, right? Part of the problem was they still got called racist for it. It was because the, the paradigm at the time was any opposition to Barack Obama was ipso facto proof of racism, and they got demonized as racist, and I think it caused a kind of psychic break for a lot of them. Um, I would also say that a certain number of Tea Party folks had what was, in my view, an extreme way of talking about the threat they saw emanating from Islam. And I agree. There was a lot of that. And uh, so it was, yeah, but go ahead. Yeah, no, and that fueled, I mean, and that fueled the populist movement, too. I don't want to go all Mickey Cows here, but... Um, <laughs> Please you know, don't. Yeah, no, I know. But... Uh, um, you know, the political science is pretty settled that large waves of immigration, um, undigestible in the short and medium term, also elicit these populist Sure, problems, absolutely. Right? And, um, and so I think you had a little bit of a perfect storm thing. I'm not saying right. that all of the motives of everybody in the Tea Party were pure or good or decent or whatever. Right. But I went to too many of them, um, too many book clubs, right, where they were reading the Federalist Papers to think that they were all motivated by evil. Right. Too many of them were into Ben Carson and, and – um, uh, uh, Herman Cain to um, for me to sort of believe that they were really sort of clan style racists the way they insisted on MSNBC and um, and so but the problem is is that that form of Tea Party now was it was hijacked by a bunch of grifters and and bullshit peddling political consultant guys who want to just monetize w want to name any names we'd all recognize uh I could sure, I'm sure I could go into my file, you know, but like, um, uh, it, it, it got, it, it got monetized really quickly. And, you know, one of its early advantages was that it was so decentralized. Mm -hmm. One of its early, its later disadvantages was that it became, uh, because it was decentralized, you never knew who was legitimate and who was just trying to bilk little old ladies out of monthly credit card impressions to fight for liberty. Right. Um, and, uh, and it became a hot mess. And I think Donald Trump emerges on the ashes of all of that and says, forget about making arguments. Forget about persuading people. They hate you. I'm going to be your, you know, your Joan of Arc, as it were. I'm going to fight your enemies. I'll represent your rage, which was a classic sort of Huey Long um, uh, approach to these things. And, you know, my view has always been that conservatism rightly understood. You know, and I come from the sort of public interest reading American Enterprise Institute guy, right, was that it boils down to essentially two things. Stripped of all of its metaphysical and prudential adornment, it boils down to the idea that ideas matter, sort of this enlightenment idea that you can persuade people, that ideas have consequences, that, that arguments framed in reason and fact can, 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 can have impact, right, and can, can persuade people. And the idea that character matters. That's, that's it, right? That's basically what conservatism brought on to. And Donald Trump defied both of those things. And it was because he defied them, not, in dis, not despite of it, that he attracted so many followers at a certain time that I found so dismaying. Huh. I've never heard that uh, definition of conservatism. It's not quite a definition, but you're saying those values are at its core. Right. Um, so uh, it's funny now. So... You mentioned, you, I think in this conversation as well as the book, you mentioned the cultural contradictions of capitalism. Right. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, how much of Trumpism you could explain in terms of just the capitalist machine, uh, a reaction against the capitalist machine. I mean, first of all, there's globalization driven by the flow of global capital and the technologies that capitalism has generated. And uh, that, first of all, has created this elite class of cosmopolitans that you can resent, who, uh, and, and, and it has led, apparently, for whatever reason, to growing income inequality, so it's easier to resent them than ever. ever. Your right. wages are stagnating. And um, Facebook and these things heighten and exacerbate oh, things. Oh, like totally, totally. And, and they were, I think, more or less, you know, inevitable, which isn't to say we can't choose to, to change them, but... Um, but then there's, uh, you know, an automation of jobs, which is, I think, an underrated uh, source of wage stagnation and, and unemployment. Um, there I think is, it plays a bigger role than immigration does. Yeah. Of, and then there the is the economic story. And then there's, there's trade, which is uh, also has held down wages in a certain sector of America as jobs 
got outsourced. And then there is immigration, which some people would call a, almost a, a part of capitalism in the sense that your, your purest capitalist would like a pretty free flow, not just a goods and services, but of labor. But in any event, all of these are forces associated with capitalism. So on the one hand, you can say white identity politics is a reaction against uh, left-wing identity politics. And I certainly agree that there's some of that dynamic. On the other hand, you could almost argue that a, a big part of this discontent just flows directly out of the unfolding of capitalism. Right? Not only could you argue it, I do argue it. Well, okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I, yeah. So, I mean, this is one of the things that I think it, it's interesting how it hasn't caught the attention of some of my friends on the right, but I think, you know, capital, I'm one of these conservatives who thinks there's no such thing as an unalloyed good thing and there's no such thing as an unalloyed bad thing. Most bad things come with an upside, you know, slavery and, and the Holocaust notwithstanding, but in normal life, right, almost every bad thing comes with an upside and every good thing comes with a downside. Capitalism is this glorious and wonderful thing. Um, I'm very much with, you know, the libertarians on it that it, that it is the greatest and in many respects, the only system ever conceived of to maximize human flourishing and prosperity, getting people to work communally together, cooperatively together, peacefully together. Its only downside is it doesn't feel like it. And it doesn't feel cooperative. It doesn't feel communal, right? Because of the, the monetization factor and, the, and, and all the obvious things. And, and so people... And so it doesn't satisfy human nature. And so human nature is constantly looking for something else to give us meaning and a sense of belonging that capitalism can't. Your business might. Well, then it might not. It depends where you work and how much fulfillment you get from your job. But capitalism as a system gives very few of anybody a sense of meaning and belonging, right? And at the same time, as Schumpeter points out, the creative destruction of capitalism isn't just aimed at bad things. It's also aimed at good things. It undermines the sort of sinews of traditional civil society. It, it's dangerous. It's, it's, it's threatening to the family in all sorts of ways that change over time. And so capitalism is indeed part of the problem. It's also part of the solution. But the, the way you fend off the problems of capitalism, capitalism is by having a robust civil society, by having a healthier family. The problem is, is that when those things break down, Capitalism floods in, politics floods in, and they try to provide you things, whether it's a sense of community on Facebook, which is bullshit, or a sense of, uh, of belonging at the national level to the federal government, which is also bullshit. Um, and that has deleterious impacts on our politics and, and is inherently alienating. And that is, and that is what is dangerous, is, is that you need this sort of, these ecosystems that can hold the worst aspects of both national politics and, um, and capitalism at bay. And that's very hard to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm about to ask you what we do about all this, but first I want to ask one more question, which, which is, um, so uh, you, you trace, you know, many of the roots of the problem you see as more fundamental than the immediate mutual reinforcement of identity politics and white nationalist politics. Right. White nationalist identity politics, the two. Uh, so identity politics on the left and the right. That said, once that tension is set in motion, um, they do tend to reinforce and exacerbate yes, yeah. each other. That's a good point. Which, yeah. which leads to, uh, well, one question I have is just a, a, a thing I'm personally interested in because I have, uh, here's my chance to plug the Mindful Resistance newsletter whose premise is that the official mainstream resistance doesn't always do an optimal job of reacting to Trumpism. The hell you say. <laughs> my question to you exactly is, as someone on the right who probably has a better sense for what's going on in Trump land than many people in the resistance, uh, do you agree that uh although a certain amount of the antagonism between the two is at this point you might say uh, natural and hard to reverse do you agree that parts of the resistance just from the point of view of their own tactical and strategic interest are reacting to trumpism in a suboptimal way from their point of view yeah no i i think that's right i mean my, my standard throwaway line um about trump is look trump's not hitler hitler could have repealed obamacare um and 
uh, so much of the resistance stuff is, is in some ways it's very similar to my mind of a lot of the sort of the crazier resistance to Obama stuff, right? Where it just, you know, doesn't matter what he does. It has to be an 11 on everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I, as, as, to be clear, I, I, I don't think Donald Trump is a good development for conservatism or for the country. But at the same time, I do think that certain, at least from a conservative perspective, some positive things are getting done. And this is the tension that people like me have of not going full Jen Rubin and just, you know, defenestrating any principle I had before just so I can be anti-Trump on everything, right? Um, and so it requires at times calling, you know, praising him when he's right about something, mm -hmm. even, you know, and because sometimes he is, you know, um, or at least sometimes his administration is. Uh, one of the great internal problems on the right is, or one of the internal debates on the right is whether or not the good things that are happening on Trump's watch are happening because of Trump or in spite of Trump. Mm -hmm. And that's probably a whole different conversation, but it's a real tension on the right and how you view the guy, right? Um, all that said, um, I think, you know, part of the problem is this, this the, the, the centrifugal forces that are created by this sort of tribal dynamic in our national politics um, make it very difficult for Democrats now to, ha to be reasonable critics of Trump. Um, because the resistance logic is you're basically a Vichy, you know, official working with the, you know, the yeah. evil regime. And that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me to demonize a big chunk of your own historic coalition, the white working class guys who voted for Obama, who are the centerpiece of the FDR coalition and claim that today they're more racist because they voted for Donald Trump than they were, say, 50 years ago, which no social science data really supports. Um, and so, I, you know, one of my favorite, I bring this up all the time, one of my favorite New Yorker cartoons, or my favorite New Yorker cartoon, my wife got it blown up and framed for me for my birthday a few years ago, has two dogs in suits drinking martinis at a bar. And one dog says to the other dog, you know, it's not good enough that dogs succeed. Cats must also fail. <laughs> and that is the defining attribute of our politics going back for about 20 years now. And it's just getting worse and worse and worse where more and more the, the rationale for X is just that, that the other side doesn't like it rather than whether or not it's good or bad. There's the, and I think Facebook brings it out worse than us. The way we watch politics as if it's a form of entertainment brings it out worse than us. Um, it is the, what I call in the book ecstatic schadenfreude. You know, this I, idea that, 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 oh, liberal tears are delicious is a justification for doing something. And, um, and I think the resistance crowd, you know, is as guilty of some forms of that kind of thinking as a lot of guys on the right are. And, and, and do certain manifestations of that actually help Trump? Politically. Oh, yeah, I think absolutely. I mean, um, I think if they, if they start day one, which I think is likely if they take back the House, with impeachment without a really good, clear, coherent argument, it's the greatest gift in the world you can give to Trump. Because then it, then it justifies his already existing obsessions and his sense of victimhood and martyrdom. It, it galvanizes his own uh, supporters. And, you know, it, in, in the late 1990s, the impeachment was seen as overreach, you know, by Republicans and it hurt Republicans. You could see a similar dynamic um, with Trump. It could also, you know, I've never thought that Trump is going to be impeached because of what Bob Mueller finds. And I could be wrong about that. Um, I've not wanted to be part of the race to be wrong first and all that stuff. So I'm basically taking a wait and see approach. But um, I've always thought if he gets impeached, um, and I mean impeached and removed, not just impeached, well, the move um, part basically can't happen. You need a two-thirds vote in the Senate. Yeah, it, it, but my point is, is that for that to be a legitimate, smart political move for Democrats, mm -hmm. even to impeach him, requires him to overreact to something. Mm -hmm. Now, it is entirely possible that that happens. My point is, it's not the substance of what they find. It is his reaction to it that, that could destroy Trump. That's why we have a special process special prosecutor in the first place is because Trump overreacted to something. Hmm. You know, so many of his problems are because he overreacts to things. Okay. So segueing to this question of what to do about it, I would just note one thing, picking up on what you just said about why the problem is so difficult. I mean, 
you mentioned that Jen Rubin uh, is, not, you know, just traditionally thought of as a conservative, seems, seems to be willing to amend a number of her uh, pre-existing views in, or, as in, by way of aligning herself with the resistance. I mean, I don't want to comment on what her motivation is. In any event, there is more, there is that change. And there is a very extreme uh, tone in her vo social media voice when she talks about Trump. You could say somewhat the same about Bill Kristol, but you gotta, you gotta give it to him. This is where the money is. Look at what's happened to the Twitter followings. I mean, and, and what I'm, my point is just that there is such an incentive to take one extreme side or the other. It is so much easier to build a social media following by being part of the problem of tribalism than by being part of the solution. And, and that's one reason I think, uh, you know, all the incentives just seem misaligned, at least misaligned with the national interest. I could not possibly agree with you more. Um, I think as somebody who has tried to, you know, who was, who was a self-described never Trumper when he was, you know, when, when, when I defined it as never voting for him, opposing his nomination, um, never endorsing him. That was what I meant by never Trump. But then once he was elected, it's like I, I, never Trump to me became a sort of meaningless term because he's president of the United States. And so you got to sort of take him as he comes. I have been by far more critical of him than I've been, you know, praiseworthy, praising of him. But every now and then I'll praise him because I think intellectual honesty requires it of me. I've fallen back. My safe harbor is just to not lie. Um, and I've, one of the most dispiriting things about this entire experience for me is how many people, longtime fans of mine, have been disappointed in me for not living down to their expectations. There was this expectation that when push came to shove, I would just become another serviceable hack and become a cheerleader. And I think this reflects some of the, some of the rot that, pre, pre, uh, that, that, that predated Trump in the, in the coziness that the conservative intellectual movement had with the Republican Party, where basically the conservative intellectual movement, conservative journalism became a de facto extension of the party system. And I think that was corrupting and problematic. I just did not appreciate how bad it was. And I think, and I think these kinds of problems very much exist on the Democratic side too. But I was just amazed in, during the primaries and in the general election, the number of conservatives I would talk to, and I'm not talking about guys who work for the RNC or political consultants. I'm talking about people who have my job, columnists, opinion journalists, right, um, who would say one thing when the camera was off and say the completely different thing when the camera was on. And then when the camera went off again, they would say, I can't believe I have to defend this guy. And my response is, you don't. You know, I mean, it's not your freaking job. And, um, and I think that as someone who... Uh, you know, it sort of makes his living largely from movement conservatism kind of audiences. I can tell you, like, one of the only things that really pisses me off is when people tell me I'm selling out because this has hurt my financial yeah. bottom line. You've got line. a funny way of showing it because you're not doing the thing that would maximize either your social media following or your revenue probably. Yeah, no, I'm, and because there are people on the left who will never accept me, right? And there are people oh, on the yeah, right. I know a few, you're right. Yeah. And the people on the right feel betrayed by me, or a lot of them. And um, I have to say, with you know, we're not going to get into all the personalities, but generally speaking, I got to say, you know, National Review, the Weekly Standard, Commentary, the sort of uh, National Affairs, uh, and then some of the think tanks um, have actually held the line pretty well in all of this, and haven't gone full Trumpy. But um, uh, Fox News, I'll still defend the news side. Um, I can't really defend much. Much. You don't, of, you don't think Sean Hannity is impartial? Uh, I think that uh, that I think that Sean once was one of these guys who thought it was all sorts of fun and games mm -hmm. with with Trump, and he was a useful blocking tackle for Ted Cruz. And now I think he believes all of it. I think that he is a true believer. He doesn't see any sort of intellectual corruption at work, any contradiction at work. He thinks do shilling for Donald Trump is the highest, best, most patriotic use of his time. And I think he actually believes it now. Um, but that's one of the more depress depressing things, speaking more generally, is the people who used to tell me that um, 
I can't believe I have to defend this guy or what a buffoon when the camera went off. A lot of them now, when the camera's off, really believe this stuff. Yeah. And they've internalized it in a way that in some ways, at least in the past, their deceits were a tribute <laughs> to the truth, <laughs> you know, and now they believe the deceit in a way and, um, or a lot of them do. And that creeps me out even more. Well, I mean, generically, the problem this is part of is just the human tendency to convince yourself that whatever you're doing is morally defensible and right. I mean, and that's, that greatly complicates the, the problem of getting ourselves out of this. That's the corruption of human nature that is a big theme of the book, right? Is that the coalition instinct, as John Tooby and Paul Bloom will call it, helps you rationalize the stuff for your team beyond all reason, right? It's just like, that's why we hold the other tribe to the worst representatives of it or the most egregious violations of moral principles. And we make all sorts of allowances for our own side. And that's why, you know, people who spent their lives defending, you know, Christian values could twist themselves into defending Roy Moore. Right. And that's a human nature thing. My dad always used to say the single most corrupting thing in journalism isn't money. It's friendship because, you know, like friendship with the politicians, you mean? Well, friendship with a politician, but just also just friendship generally. Right? I mean, the example he always used to use, and I don't think it just applies to journalism. I think it applies to all sorts of things. If some stranger called you up and said, I'll give you $5,000 to give my kid a job, you almost surely would say, screw you, right? Mm -hmm. But if some old, old friend of yours called up mm -hmm. and said, hey, look, you know, you know, my kid's had a rough time, but I think he's great. Do you think he could help him out? He really would love that job, blah, blah, blah. I'm not saying you'd do it, but you'd think about it a lot more than the offer of money, Right. And that's human nature. We are, mm -hmm. as you know, you know, everyone go buy moral animal. Um, there's never been a society in human history where people didn't give preference for kin, for friends, for allies over strangers. And that, that is the pull of human nature as much as anything else is. And our politics now, because they're getting more tribal, we are viewing everything through these prisms of my coalition versus your coalition. And I don't mean coalition in the, political science sense i mean right. in any group of people who see themselves as having a common interest especially as opposed to some other group right so so we are then we've arrived at the at the moment of salvation and you're going to tell us what we do about all this jonah buy gold <laughs> um like I, I so first of all i don't have sweeping public policy proposals in the book um uh the because I am with, I'm largely persuaded by Deirdre McCloskey about a lot of this stuff, although I do find the stuff by um, Douglas North about institutions also persuasive, which is funny because they hate each other or they, they stand opposed to each other. And I actually think there's a synthesis there. But, um, you know, the, part of the argument that I end with is, is an argument about rhetoric. It's about, you know, that, that if we don't teach people, to have some gratitude for how good it is and to talk about how good it is and about how much we have to be grateful for, you create a vacuum that lets resentment and entitlement, which can be monetized in our system so much better than gratitude can, swamp everything else. And so part of it is a rhetorical approach that I think should appeal to most people of left and right of good faith, that there are things that we could do a better job celebrating in this culture, right? Um, and that's certainly true in journalism, where everyone wants to talk about racial animosity and not talk about the fact that, you know, racial attitudes in this country have improved enormously, that, you know, if the idea that, if the, if the hard version of identity politics is true, that white people and black people can never get past the iron cage of identity, how come intermarriage rates have been going like this for so long? I mean, presumably some people aren't so irredeemably racist if, if they're willing to make babies with people of another race, right? So some of that is just figuring out how to improve the narrative and how we talk about things. But if you want a public policy approach, I, I truly and passionately believe that one of the uniting themes of all of these different trends, whether it's populism or identity politics um, and nationalism, stems from the erosion of civil society, the erosion of the family. And I think that one of the things that would most help our society is if we could push as much political power to the most local level possible. And um, you can't have slavery, you can't have Jim Crow, 
we amended the Constitution, we fought a civil war. Those are off limits. There's some things, you know, that are just settled civilizational dogma. That's it. But beyond that, right, letting more people feel like they actually have power in their own lives, that they know the powers that be in their own lives, right, that um, you still have culture wars. But the good thing about a culture war at the local level is the winners have to look the losers in the eye the next day. The winners and the losers know each other by name. Their kids go to the same school. They see each other at the supermarket. That breeds a certain sense of humility and openness to the other side's point of view. Fights can still get ugly, but at the very least, it's contained to where people actually live, and it gives people a sense of control over their lives because so much that has elicited this riot of romanticism in our culture is this sense that, the world is alienated, alienating, that people don't have control over their own lives, that big corporations and big political forces are running everything. And if you can push this stuff to the most local level possible, would people make mistakes? Sure. But people would all, more people would actually be able to live the, the way they want to live, and they would think democracy has some, some meat to it. And, I've, and it, would, it would enrich institutions of civil society in ways that this... It, in ways that right now they're being weakened as the federal government crowds out a lot of the mediating institutions in our life. Okay, a couple of quick bits of uh, left-wing pushback there. I mean, first of all, returning power to the local level doesn't sound exactly like an ideologically neutral proposal. We wouldn't necessarily expect one. You're on the right, but I mean, a specific okay. example of, uh, of a problem you might have on the left is if you mean things like uh, keeping the current uh, proportion of public school funding that is dependent on local taxation, what it is, or even increasing it, that of course has led to a certain inequality of resources among uh, different districts that, that is sure. correlated with, with ethnicity and so on. There's, there's a separate thing. This is not so much an ideological point, but it's occurred to me that uh, it, it was when I started thinking through Roe versus Wade, which, which even a lot, you know, a number of uh, progressives that I know and respect think was, was, wrongly decided. I mean, they're pro-choice, but right. they, think, they think that there was a, some pretty creative jurisprudence going on in, 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 in asserting that the Supreme Court could settle the matter. Um, but, but if you, if that's, if things like abortion and, and gay rights start differing state by state, in the long run, couldn't that increase the fragmentation? Because it's like, you know, young liberal where, decide, where am I going to college? Well, I'm not going to college in a, in a, in a, in a state or locality that where, you know, and so on. you get it. Yeah. They're going to go to the places that have the liberal values. So you could actually, there's some, you know, there, there seems to be a tendency anyway toward this kind of residential segregation by values. Mm -hmm. so you can imagine one virtue of some of these issues being decided at the federal level uh, is kind of retarding that tendency. Yeah, I look, I, I think your point about schools is perfectly well taken. And then again, my point is, is if you send the power back to the most local level possible, the money would go with it too. I have no principled objection to the idea that the bulk of your taxes would be paid at the local level, not the federal level. Now, there are repercussions from all of that. But um, as a matter of sort of first principles, I actually think the pyramid should be closer to upside down than the way it is now. Um, Right, but that would perpetuate the inequality in, in education. It might, it might not. I mean, if, 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 you know, you, but you'd have to have, but you'd have to have political fights about it at the local level. And it seems to me if you're going to have those fights anyway, the closer to the problem you are, the better you're going to be about figuring out the solution to it. Um, I agree with you. Things like abortion are going to end up becoming federal issues. Um, because they get at this thing about what it means to be a human being, right? This is why slavery ultimately had to be a federal issue because it's a metaphysical question about what this entire country is about. The thing that bothers me is that you don't have to go whole hog with the big questions first. You know, you can just baby steps, right? I mean, when, when Ted Cruz was talking about Ninth and Tenth Amendment stuff, almost the entire liberal sort of New York Times op-ed page crowd was going nuts about how this is unpatriotic secessionist talk. This is outrageous, yada, yada, yada. Now there's a serious movement in California for California to secede because Donald Trump is president. I, I, I don't want to say gotcha. I want buy-in. 
I want people to understand that like, and when you talk to college kids about this, right? Um, it's one of the few things that kind of pings their transpartisan brains. You can say, you know, look, why should you not, why, you know, if, if, why does the government in Washington have to get to decide, first of all, whether you can smoke weed, but also whether um, you can buy stinky cheese or organic this or that the brewery you're having has to be pasteurized beer. Why does that have to be a federal thing? Is it really that the government in Oregon wants to kill its own citizens with, with toxic beer and cheese? No, push the shit down as much as possible and, and, and tolerate the possibility that other people might want to live in ways that, that you don't like and you don't have to. So if San Francisco wants to let its freak flag fly, fine. If some town in South Carolina wants to ban alcohol or, 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 or ban dancing like in Footloose or something, who gives a shit? Have that fight at the local level and at least you feel like you have control over your life. Does it, it doesn't mean that some things can, are, aren't inevitably going to be bumped up and you're going to have some states that are going to be far more progressive about education spending than other states. Let, let people sort according to those ways. Why does it have to be one size fits all from Washington? Okay, well, thank you. And to kind of just step back and get your, the big picture again, what you're ultimately aiming for is to take these tribal impulses and kind of transfer them to change them from being in an attachment to an ethnic group, whatever, to being an attachment to these ideals. Basically, yeah. I mean, that human nature, you're not going to get rid of human nature. The founders understood that. Um, they understood that people formed coalitions. They called them factions. Um, and the, but the, the whole point of a civilization is to channel and check human nature towards productive ends. And instead, we live in this romantic moment where we think that our, the inner light of our own authenticity is the only source of, of legitimacy. Our feelings matter more than our arguments. And this is a problem on the right and the left. And it's dangerous because that is how human societies were organized when we had bad dentistry and people ended up dying um, short, ugly, violent deaths for most of human history. And, um, and ultimately what I want people to come, you know, the reason why I call it suicide of the West, I don't call it death of the West or, you know, is that I don't believe there's any teleology. I don't, sorry, Mr. Non-Zero. Um, I, I don't think you can outsource things to the right side of history. Every generation has to do its work. And there aren't enough people, as we were talking about earlier, willing to defend on the left and the right, the basic decency of our system and our country and the way it's supposed to work. Okay, well, thank you. As you said, it's suicide in the West, how the rebirth of tribalism, populism, nationalism, and identity politics is destroying American democracy by Jonah Goldberg. Looks like this. It is available for purchase on the very day that uh, we're going to post this, which is, I think, Tuesday, April 24th. Is that the pub date? Yep. Okay. So Thanks, thank Bob. you so much, Jonah, and good luck with the book. It's nice to be back. Bring yeah, back memories, you, know? you should come back more often. Well, you said I can only come back when I have a book. I, I just changed the policy. <laughs> I'm talking to you that we're, that we're going to overhaul our whole approach to these things. Oh, I appreciate it. Thanks, man. Okay. See you.